What's going Hello. on, boy? On. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Steve. Hello, oh, boy. Hello, Ryan. Uh, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely day for us. It is. It's uh, 71 degrees in New York City today, so I might actually go for a walk later and uh, get to enjoy the weather a little bit. Very cool. I don't want to tell you what it's like in San Diego. We'll just leave that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, thank you for being with us here today, Steve. I, th you know, I think, uh, I think most of the folks who tune into this monthly uh, are probably pretty familiar with Ryan and myself. But I'm Boyan, co-founder, CEO here at Hyper. Ryan, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself real quick and then pass it off to Steve. Definitely, uh, Ryan Rocliffe, Field TTO, uh, and Steve. Uh, let's introduce you to the uh, the rest of the audience here. Absolutely. Hello, I'm super excited to be here live. My name is Steve Craig, and I'm founder and CEO of Peak IDV. Peak IDV is a community powered learning hub that helps solution providers, practitioners, and investors level up their knowledge in digital identity. I'm on a mission to enable 10,000 professionals to become experts in identity and invite you on this journey. That was uh, an awesome intro. And for I those of you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like, you know, uh, it was very well created. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think it, it makes sense to let the audience uh, in on this, but um, the, the intro that just Steve uh, gave us was uh, AI generated. Um, and, and Steve, like to, to create that type of intro, how much, uh, how much training material did you need to give your mm -hmm. AI friend? It was about 30 seconds of video in front of a green screen and about two minutes of processing time and less than $29. Ah, there you go. <laughs> it's insanely cheap, insanely short compared to what we used to have to deal with. Yeah, I remember, you know, seeing deep fake type of uh, uh, demos, you know, five, six years ago, and it required a lot more resources than what you just described to pull off um, and some significant expertise. And so it's amazing to be living in the in the uh, world that we live in right now, where things are just changing so rapidly. Um, but we do want to talk about today um, on how organizations can prevent against deepfakes in the um, in the age of generative AI. Like we do live in this; it's exciting. Uh, I get to play with these tools and products daily. Our customers are are facing a lot of these attacks and. It's exciting to be in a position where we can actually build technology and processes with them to help to help out. And in, in, um, just real quick, I mean, like Steve, you've been working around the, the IDV world quite quite some time overall, so you've you've gotten your hands pretty deep on on some of these some of the technologies as well as some of the trends and patterns. Um, what would you say you're seeing as an accelerator, or or how things are moving as fast as they are compared to the last five years? Deep fakes aren't new. Uh, the generative ad adversarial networks have existed for some time now, but they were very complex to leverage. So you, you actually had to have some technical skills. In the last few years, this explosion in generative media companies has really democratized access. A lot of companies are using them for good purposes to create content, but a lot of bad actors are starting to leverage those tools and uh, they're using that for impersonation or they're getting ideas from publicly available tools and they're digging into GitHub re repos and actually making use of this technology. So it is picking up very rapidly. So as we as we move forward through our LinkedIn Live, just to, you know anybody who is watching, if you do make any questions or comments, we are watching for those and we'll address those as they come, uh, or we'll address them at the very end. And we'll we'll keep some slides kind of going for some conversation pieces. I think it just kind of supports our, our our conversation on the specific topic around deep fakes and. And I think just as you alluded to, Steve, um, some of the headlines kind of are out there already. And we're seeing the the nefarious uses or the bad actors finding ways to capitalize on some of these things. Um, Boy, on if you want to shed some light on some of the the lovely little, uh, you know, highlights or, or headlines that we've got up here. Yeah, you know, it, there's this continuous kind of uh, thought process now that's become pretty prevalent uh, in this in the identity security industry, which is, hey, 
you know, there's no longer a phishing attack. Now every phishing attack is a spear phishing attack, uh, essentially, and, and can be used as such. So lots of organizations have spent, you know, significant resources and time and change management uh, headaches have been had as part of deploying multi-factor authentication technologies, which is great and absolutely necessary. But now a lot of the automated phishing attacks um, are even more automated using uh, AI. And we'll spend a good bit of time talking about that. And I was actually just listening to the latest uh, podcast episode of Darknet Diaries that actually had Rachel Toback on there, where she was talking about how you know she was able to get um, uh, this, uh, the passport number for the host of 60 minutes or something in less than five minutes by cloning her voice uh, and, and making a fake phone call to her uh, producer or her assistant who uh, has that information. And it's just amazing just how sim simple some of these things can be to execute nowadays. And in the hands of the right creative malicious mind just how far it can go and we've seen the examples of you know millions of dollars already being uh stolen uh through wire fraud and things like that through um through these attacks and look if you work at a financial institution or some hedge fund or something and you know the guy who the guy who runs the fund calls you over the phone and says hey i need you to wire 10 million dollars to this account now you know chances are you're probably going to do it because you recognize the voice, you recognize the phone number. It's easy enough to spoof all that type of information. Yeah. The, shout out to Rachel. And if you're bored, Rachel, let us know. You can come hang out with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve, do you have anything on the headlines? Yeah, it's, it's just gotten really simple to do these videos. And if you use tools, you can actually inject in the feed just as an example. So it is very hard to detect deep fake videos if you're using standard webcam tools. It is possible to inject videos and images directly into the camera feed. You might think you're speaking with a real person, but it could be a deep fake clone. The crazy thing is scams and fraud used to be easy to spot. Spelling errors, imperfect language, or if you received a phone call, a very clear sign that the call was coming from overseas. Now, the barrier to entry for perfect fraud has dropped with tools like ChatGPT and LLMs. Por ejemplo, no hablo español con fluidez, hablo un poco. Pero con esa tecnología puedes crear rápidamente traducciones a través de herramientas que coinciden con las palabras que estás diciendo en la boca y casi podrían convencer a un hablante nativo. <laughs> and I'm back. I, I forgot one thing, guys, which is to alert you of when it's real Steve. <laughs> That's the real Steve sound. <laughs> um, Your Spanish is excellent, by the way. It's, uh, yeah, muchas gracias. Yeah. Bueno, hablar un poquito también, so you never know. <laughs> so definitely in support of Identity Management Day, right? Um, we, we definitely want to make sure that we are spreading awareness in, in support of Identity Management Day. Uh, and apparently we're going to get deep faked on random um, by by Steve through this episode. Um, there is uh, there's quite a bit of awareness, I think, that it is bestowed upon most of us who do spend our time in identity to you know share and expose quite a bit to the the rest of what we're rest of the industry that we're seeing. Um, what those attack vectors look like, what are possibly defensive mechanisms that we can take, which is obviously the point of our, our LinkedIn Live this uh, today. Um, supporting a lot of the challenges that businesses have. I know that I've had a lot of conversations where the very first thing that comes up is, hey, how do I defend against deep fake? Uh, and I think it's, we'll, we'll end up in this conversation kind of navigating that we may not be at the point where it is that I need to sit here and know that Steve is Steve right here, right now. Um, I think there's other alternative paths for us to look at defensive mechanisms. Going into the the support of the the, the market and what customers are saying, uh, we do have some statistics that are showing that, you know, once again, we know that breaches are happening. The 84% number has not really paired or changed drastically. It's been an 80 to 85 for what, eight years at least. Um, 
and 78% are experiencing direct business at impact. We could look at those headlines. We could look at all those breaches. We know what the remediation efforts are going to be, what IR is. We know what the, the mitigation af uh, after, after the fact. Um, there is no way it does not impact business. And I don't think anybody on, on this LinkedIn Live, LinkedIn Live would, would disagree with that. Um, anything you guys want to share on, on, on this topic? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves because, you know, one of the things that it's really easy to do now with, with deep fakes is um, it, it'll be super easy to create these deep fakes of individuals who have any sort of video presence on the internet, right? Which means that we'll, we'll start seeing these deep fakes being created of uh, you know, CEOs, CIOs, people who give presentations at companies in particular. Uh, anybody who's done a webinar like this, you know, that information is out there, that video uh, sampling data is out there, and it can be used to create these deep fakes. Um, and, and it'll be fascinating to just observe how that kind of uh, higher tier of individuals at these companies is going to become a primary target and how they respond to it. I think that'll be just fascinating to watch over the next couple of years. And, and I've demonstrated video, but audio is just as much of a challenge. And if you think about, let's just say, public company CEOs that are during, doing earnings calls every quarter, that's a lot of training data that you can get just from them speaking about their company. And a lot of the tools that you pay to use have guardrails. So they, they have some governance to it, but it's not too difficult to get access to libraries and other resources where there are no guardrails and use that training data. And then suddenly you're not just getting the text from the CEO saying you need access, but you're getting a voicemail or you're getting a real-time call. The technology is good enough. If I wanted to spend a little bit of more money, I could have made this a live streaming video representation of me. So it's just getting really easy to access this tech and use it for bad. Yeah, and even to support that, I mean, that's the story that Rachel was sharing on on the 60 Minutes. I watched that episode of 60 Minutes where she was able to get a hold of the passport and everything. And basically, uh, in Rachel's fashion, put on a really good display of how how simple it really is. Um, you know, <clears throat> continue on uh, the attack surface side, you know, we're still seeing statistics coming up that, you know, <laughs> we're witnessing an increase in cyber attacks in 23. I think... If we were to just watch any pattern of attacks, it's just always going to be an increase year over year because technology is a, that great kind of benefit yet that risk, right? Where as technology gets easier and easier, attacks get easier and easier. So it, in essence, we're going to see either a, a derivative or an alteration of the attacks, but they're just going to keep on point, right? They're, as long as tech is the way it is, I mean... I know Boyan and you and I sit back and we make fun of OTPs and and bad passwords and and things of that nature. And we now have a tech to to alleviate us from that. But it's it's going to continuously evolve, and we're going to have until we get our mission achieved, uh, we will see I think 75, 80 percent increases year over year. Um, 85 percent is a pretty big number on attributing it to to generative AI. This just means a what adoption of, of these tools of nefarious actors or bad actors is just that easy. As Steve has been explaining, I think over and over again, $29 and basically two minutes of, of uh, I would say even five minutes in total of invested time mm -hmm. for you to produce passable content, pa passable mm -hmm. deep fake. Yeah. And, you know, we've seen this where, you know, we, we usually talk about like Russian or Chinese nation state hackers or sp state sponsored groups that are doing these attacks. And oftentimes they're executing these attacks in English against American or Western European companies because, you know, those that's where the money has traditionally been. And as a result, those organizations who are targets of those attacks have been the ones spending tens, hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes in their cybersecurity programs. But now you can get a, you know, a, a Russian hacker who can use an AI tool to target a Japanese bank or a Thai bank, you know, who doesn't have a thousand person cyber team with, you know, a very robust program and be extremely effective in the local language and the local context. 
right? And and that is particularly scary, just the force multiplier that these tools can become for the adversaries in particular. Shall we share one more example on the deep fake front? We Absolutely. Can, we can definitely share one more example if you're ready. So I'm in San Diego and I love to go down to the border, go over into Tijuana and get some great food. But what if I got into some trouble? Mm. Spanish example, let's say this scenario pops up. Ryan, you get a call. Ring, ring. Hey, Ryan, it's Steve, dude. I'm on some serious trouble. I took the trolley down to the border, crossed over to TJ to have some bomb food at this taco shop, but I got into some trouble. Hold up. Sí, señor. Lo siento. Estoy llamando a mi amigo para pedirle el dinero. Colgaré el teléfono y pagaré. Hey, sorry. Can you Venmo me like 500 bucks? Not to my main phone, though. I have a burner phone because I lost my main phone. Send me five hundred dollars to five 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 five. Please, I gotta go now. I will pay you back. That's a lot of fives, so it didn't sound nice. as good with a bunch of fives. But Ryan, please, can I get five hundred dollars? Then no. yes, well, it's, the problem is, is that that's not your burner number. I have a different one for you on your burner. Uh, so. I had a burner. <laughs> But, you know, uh, think about like, you know, kids calling their parents or grandparents and saying like, hey, I'm stuck at this place. You know, I, I, I lost my phone. I need to get home. Can you Venmo my friend $100 for an Uber? And like just how accurate that would be and how easy that is to execute mm -hmm. with these types of, types of tools. They, well, the, yeah, it's the already CEO been reported too. Yeah, it's already been reported. There's been quite a few um, individuals that have been scammed out of thousands of dollars uh, because somebody reported or, or called their their parent and said that they were in jail. They need to get bail and to wire money to this lawyer through a very suspicious, I mean, tactic. But when you're in that state of mind, right, you you're going to respond in a much different way, and, and it's harder for you to identify fraud as a person, but they're already reporting that these these tactics are, are already deployed against individuals. I agree. And that, I think that's a good segue to talk about the cyber kill chain and really how hackers work and, and the steps that they have to take in order to execute a, let's say, a phishing attack or a scam like this, right? Typically, if they're doing what they do, like it's a lot of effort involved, right? They have, they have to do research. They have to do... Uh, open uh, open source intelligence, right? They go on people's social media, LinkedIn accounts, you know, Twitter, whatever else, and look at their behavior, look at the way that they act, and and uh, typically tailor attacks specifically for that uh, individual or for that organization. Um, all of this now can be done in a purely automated fashion. Yeah, the the reconnaissance side, just like OSN with a lot of these tools i was just working with something um last night i'm not going to expose which one it was or what i was doing um <laughs> but there's a way to chain a lot of the tools together to start in essence there is some way for me to build an automated team and that team all go out and do individual tasks and then return back with all the information in a very efficient very fast very clean way um, for very low cost. Something that would take somebody hopping from from site to site, doing all those steps, which we would invest probably a couple hours as you do that recon. This is getting down to like 30 minutes, if not less, and not having to be in front of the machine while it's doing it, or I don't have to navigate and invest my own personal time. I'm shipping it off to a machine to do. Um, that is, it's a very good business model uh, if you're spending time going there and doing that reconnaissance. Um, <clears throat> even in the weaponization, like the delivery, that can be all automated. Uh, so there's not going to be much lift there. The The delivery component, I think, you know, being that we know phishing is pretty successful and even now spear phishing, as you brought up, Boyan, is uh, basically the, the standard form of phishing today, not necessarily the the spray and pray, but more, much more targeted. I think that front part is where we have to kind of concentrate those, those first things, those first parts, because everything else, there, there are room for AI, but from a defensive posture, 
I think the cyber kill chain has to evolve to start looking at it from an authentication context. Um, but Steve, obviously, uh, Boyan and I have been chatting it up <laughs> on this topic the most. If you want to, you know, shed some light as well. Yeah, I, I agree 100%, Ryan. And when you think about all of the infiltration points, some of the scenarios we, we just went through with spoofing or impersonating to be able to do a ripoff or one, but you could have new employees coming through the interview process where every interview is some sort of deep fake or some stream deep fake. And it can happen real time. And then you have this challenge with help desks. You have this challenge with internal decision making. So there are a lot of different places where this technology could be leveraged. And it's not just about the media. It's also about the ability to dox or to research people at scale to do that spear phishing. And so when you combine all these tools, this is a very sophisticated operation. And these are being uh, perpetrated by rogue nation states or by militant hacking groups. This is not necessarily... Steve, that's in the basement, that's just trying to get $500 out of you. These are very large dollar amounts. So you really have to think holistically about all the entry points where these attacks could happen. And what would you do to thwart them? What are the, the uh, measures and pieces you could put in place to attack and, and typically, like you can, you know, hackers can essentially chain these scenarios where they will look for opportunities when they know there's a lot of internal chaos. Like Steve, you mentioned earlier, like an earnings call. Right, like typically companies, you know, always announced what uh, what time their earnings call will be and who's participating. Well, you know, if the CEO needs something thirty minutes for an earnings call, like people are going to be very quick to jump on getting that thing for the CEO because they need it for that call, right? So they're less likely, they're more likely to skirt around security processes in that instance. So if you're a hacker you execute the attack in that point in time, for example, to to try to get the most uh, bang for your buck there. So combining these things and having AI even like track, hey, when are earnings calls for these executives or when are, you know, when are they about to board a flight or when are they about to do something? Moments in time where people are most likely to make a mistake and then attacking in that particular moment. Uh, AI can time that, you know, a thousand times at scale uh, better than than any mm. human being attacker. Yeah, that social engineering aspect, like creating that urgency and duress, and people wanting to do a good job and not get in trouble, like it just all adds to the mistakes that happen in that process. Yeah. So I think we talked a lot about doom and gloom. <laughs> here's here's the threat. Here's the challenges. Here's there's got to be a way for us to start looking at a couple of different things. I I know we have a our view that is a uh, very much more geared towards. Um, a preventive maybe uh, scenario under identity assurance under the model that we we definitely operate under here. Uh, I kind of alluded to a little bit of it that, that the protections actually really have to go up front because you, in all actuality, I don't think you can defend against reconnaissance. I mean, as humans on social media, Facebook, you're going to, there's just a trove of data out there. And let's not talk about the breaches in which you can go find me all day long. Um, I get letters at least, I think, I'm up to three this year already from businesses that have been exploited. So we're not going to be able to prevent that. Um, but we can start preventing where we're binding, I guess, the users in their identities mm -hmm. and then how you keep authenticating them. I think I was kind of sneaking some of that in earlier with the preventive measure is how do you take that physical identity and, and truly link it to a digital identity? And that's where you put your preventive measures up front. And we can sit here and talk about the deep fakes components, but there's an IDV technology that's already kind of doing pretty well on on that uh, on the images that are being submitted. I think there's another technology that's going to be coming in the future that will help even mitigate that, which will fall under um, MDL or mobile mobile driver's licenses for the U.S. There's already, I think, Europe has national IDs that have some digital footprints as well, which I think. Are, are additional preventive measures there as well as then how do you actually authenticate users into an environment like we saw those headlines earlier where somebody was convinced in a zoom that they had an employee deep faked live with them and they alleviated well how did that that employee actually access that zoom or or that that conference if you had to do some sort of strong authentication up front after that with that tight linking of identity this is in essence, deep fake protection is, is well before the actual implementation of this technology that we've been discussing on, on this LinkedIn Live. 
uh, obviously open for argument and debate on on the approach for for anybody who wants to. Yeah, it really comes to like two primary controls, which is how are we bootstrapping this person's identity to begin with? Like, so they come into, let's say, our organization as an employee. How do we really know that it's them? And then after we bootstrap the identity, how do we make sure that on a daily basis, it's still them, right? And and the two primary attack vectors for those two points in time are, one is, hey, I'm going to call the help desk or go through the HR onboarding process and pretend to be this individual. So that's where the deep fake detection is super important. Um, that's where a combination of factors and signals becomes more critical than ever because the likelihood of a, of a hacker being able to bypass things like a location check, a phone number check, a face recognition check, a, a video check with a peer or a manager or, or somebody that knows them all at the same time is pretty unlikely, right? So uh, we're going to need a the ability to, to uh, do multiple points of verifications at once um, and be able to do that in a continuous manner. And then on the authentication side, on the day-to-day -day access piece, the phishing resistance variable is is just so important, right? Like if companies are still relying on SMS one-time codes or you know things like push notifications or God forbid passwords, um, I think you know those are all very probabilistic ways of verifying a person's identity. Right. I, whenever I talk about passwords in particular with people, I tell them like, hey, the longer that the user has a password, the less secure it is, because every single day that goes by, the likelihood of them, you know, uh, copying and pasting it into the wrong place or writing it down on a piece of paper or uh, it, that reusing that password for some other third party service that then gets breached, uh, the likelihood of that goes up every single day. So reducing their reliance on those is going to be more important by mo more important than ever by using things like FIDO standards and really making sure that users can't fall back to a less secure method. Because if I'm a hacker, I'm just going to go to the least secure way that you verify or identify a person. Like I'm not going to try to bypass your sophisticated MFA if I can just pick up the phone, uh, give the last four of a person's social security number and the date that they started at the company and, and get access to their account. Mm -hmm. Steve, what do you, you think? You, you make a really good point, boy. I've been in this space for almost 10 years and I've worked with a lot of practitioners, uh, companies that are uh, deploying these type of technologies. And they often think about the problem in a way that they're trying to solve for everyone. So they allow these paths to be open for users that have certain types of devices or they allow certain workflows that ultimately the hackers exploit. So as an example, I've worked with companies that don't want to integrate the vendor's SDK because there's a lift that goes into that. But then as you saw today, you can do things like take over the camera stream. Now I'm here, but I'm there. Who is it? Who's really there? Like you can inject into the feed and you can take over things like the FaceTime call or the Zoom call or when you're uploading documents, those sort of things could very easily be uh, hijacked by the fraudster and you solve the problem to help your end consumer to get through, but then you've increased the amount of fraud and other uh, bad actor activity that can come through as well. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. So as we're, we're getting close to our 30 minutes, usually we like to try to keep these at 30 minutes or less. Um, <clears throat> we can do a quick recap um, of what we think is a, a viable starter kit for every everybody who's either watching or paying attention is, uh, obviously, internal education, which we're trying to help from the, the our position, trying to help give some uh, in, enablement and education from what we're seeing as as industry individuals. Um, we're always going to advocate for the passwordless and phishing resistant MFA. We got to get we got to get rid of those passwords, um, and we need to get even legacy MFA has to come off the table. In my opinion, um, it's it's time. Uh, adaptive risk is always going to be a component, and it's evolving. Uh, we're going to start seeing additional signals come. I think through um, some of these other situations where there's vulnerabilities and exploitations. Uh, I think coming back to frictionless identity verification, this is the stuff that Boyan was talking about as well, is how do we actually initially bind users uh, to that digital um, identity, but it needs to be frictionless. We, we do have end users that 
you can't make it too complicated for we got to make it nice and simple um and and i think it's a cornerstone that um it is an evolution i, I think it's for us as, as as hyper we look at it this way which is uh user initiated authentication is is kind of putting the power back into the user's hands they're initiating the 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 task. It's no longer a response to a system. It's them actually knowing that they are going to pursue something and not being surprised by a push notification or something else that comes downstream. Um, so user initiated authentication is definitely something that we are advocates for as well. I don't know, Boyan, if you want to add anything. Yeah, that you that that proving intent, right? Like when somebody calls up the help desk or somebody is accessing a system, be able to prove intent that it actually is them and they are wanting to do this action is going to be more critical than ever. And the only way that that can be done is by using uh, math, right? And and standards like FIDO in particular use public key cryptography, which is math-based to prove that intent. And that's why these things are more important than ever. Steve, anything you want to add on a, on a defensive starter kit that we may have missed on these bullet points? No, I think these are all great. The thing that I push out in the market is education. The more you know, the better you can serve your customers, the more you can fight fraud, just staying in tune with all of the advancements in technology, uh, the uses for good and the uses for bad. And in a final plug for myself, I host a podcast series called the Peak ID, the Executive Series. And this week we're featuring Boyan. So after this, please go out and watch that episode, we get into some really interesting topics. And thank you to the Hyper team for letting me participate in this. Thanks for having, thanks yeah. for being with us, Steve. Yeah, th definitely. Thanks for um, joining us. And you said more, you know, you know, the more you know, all I saw is the NBC logo. I just uh, <laughs> wonder if you'd have just found a way to sneak. I, I need to have that or just uh, another <laughs> one of those. Uh, then... <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, um, with that, thank you, Boyan. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hopefully, everybody uh, has a wonderful afternoon. Hopefully, there was some value for, for those who were uh, attending or watching or for those who are uh, maybe watching a recorded version of this. Uh, once again, if you have any questions or if you have any topics or anything, just fire them towards us and, and we can look to address these on, on another LinkedIn Live. And um, hopefully, uh, everybody has a great time. Yeah, thank you all. See you thank next you. month. See ya.